Okay, so, <sighs> inverted ducks. The whole thing started off me doing performance me measurement on NVDIMs. So I'm just, um, I will be calling them NVDIMs, those, those no, non-volatile storage devices, uh, because they're just having too many names. So you could po possibly call it AP or Obtain or whatever you name it. Um, I will be calling it NVDIMs. I hope you know what, what I'm meaning. So the whole thing started off as I did in performance measurement on NVDIMs. And to do that, I've put an XFS on them and mounted it once with DAX and once with no DAX, just to figure out, all right, what does happen? What did happen was that the DAX-mounted XFS was actually slower than the no DAX-mounted one, which I found slightly confusing because the whole idea of having DAX is to make things faster. Right, okay, maybe not. Exactly. That was, that was the remark I had in mind when I started working on it. I said, all right, so what is it good for anyway? I mean, it must have some use case, otherwise the whole thing would be pointless. Um, we come to this later. So, just a bit of introduction. The, uh, well, felt umpteenth time that you get this introduction, anyway. Um, so. And we units are just um, persistent memory, and the stated goal of it is that the performance would be somewhat below main memory, but well above classical persistent storage. Oh, there's a typo. It's persistent, not persistent. Anyway, and um, the whole thing is um, can be run in various mo in two different modes. So it can either look like normal memory, or it can look uh, can be put in something called app direct mode which means it's not memory, it's more looking like a storage device, but not quite, so with some specific features, which normal storage devices don't really have. In any way, um, in both cases, software needs to be aware that this is a different type of thing. So either ways, you just essentially kill your performance of your entire system if you're not taking this into account. Um, you can configure the NVDIMs into things called namespaces. It's being inherited from all the modern storage devices. The all, for all modern storage, it has to be namespaces. It could be something else, why ever they thought it prudent to, name, to use namespaces, but anyway. And um, an added quirk there is that on the, by hardware, you can actually put them into interleaf mode. So you can actually combine several of these physical DIMs to have a larger construct, and the hardware will take care of interleaving accesses to the various DIMs, which is okay if they want to do it. Sure, by all means, please do. But it also means that suddenly you actually need the hardware for doing so, and you can't easily abstract things away because it's done on hardware on the far side, so the CPU doesn't even know about it. And um, the namespaces themselves, are, the inf informations about them are stored on labels, as they're called, which is essentially just metadata on, on top um, at the start of the NVIDIA themselves, or the leaf set, interleaf set. So the app direct mode is, um, is actually coming in various flavors. That is, once it's a persistent memory, once as persistent memory, where the namespace itself is byte addressable. Then there's a block mode where the whole thing is runs in, guess what, indeed, in block mode. So you have it block addressable. And then there's also another one, block mode with power fail write atom atomicity, um, which again is a block device, but this actually guarantees that any block you write will be written atomicity, uh, which is a bit of an odd thing. And mm, yeah, okay, you can do it, but mm, Again, if you already have to tweak your application, you can as well tweak it to guarantee that the writes are done if you expect them to. So, a bit of a weird thing. It's really just a legacy interface, or, or it looks like a leg legacy interface. For normal, for the block mode, namespaces, they will pre present it from the Linux side, just like normal block devices, looking just like fast storage. Um, the persistent memory, on the other hand, can be used directly. So, if we were going for block mode, the whole thing would be dead easy because that is just appearing just like a normal um, block device driver. 
and which means you can just, it just falls into the existing infrastructure and nothing special needs to be done. Um, but of course, if you do that, you have quite a bit of layers uh, on top of which to mangle the I.O. into something which the, the block layer understands and then it needs to mangle them again into something which the NVDIM driver understands and then the NVDIM driver needs to mangle them again into something which the NVDIM physically understands. So there are quite some layers in between which don't really increase the performance, which is a bit unsatisfactory because what you really wanted was fast storage. So hence they added a, as this app direct, which stands for application direct access. So they said, right, okay, let's le let the application access it directly. The, and hence there's something called PMDK for persistence memory, persistent memory development kit, um, allowing the application to indeed leverage the, um, or talk to the NVIDIA directly, bypassing everything directly to the NVIDIAs which is okay and obviously will give you the most performance if done correctly. But then, you know, I'm doing kernels. I'm doing the Linux kernel. It's a bit unsatisfactory just to push it to someone else, just declared at someone else's problem. No, I don't want it. I want to use it. I want to enable the kernel to actually have a fast access. This is not what I want. This is just, well, just talking things away and hoping it will, it, no one will notice. So, to handle it properly, the Linux kernel has something called direct access. If you were using the persistent memory as a backing store for file systems, that's not very efficient because file systems are actually geared up for sending down data in large chunks. Unfortunately, this is the one thing which the NVDIMs can't do properly. Not so much by design, but rather due to implementation quirks. That there are some erratas for the Intel CPU stating that, oh, incidentally, you can't do a fast block copy on NVDIMs. So you have to do it mem copy by hand for each byte. Okay, that surely makes sense and make things faster. Not quite. And the other disadvantage is that as you're saying down large chunks, you lose the byte address addressability. Because, well, you're saying down a large chunk, not a single byte. So to allow file systems to actually make use of NVDIMS and the byte addressability, they put something in called DUCS for. So this one is based on the ideas from the original XIP file system created by the um, mainframe folks. They did a very similar thing because the mainframe at the time had a peculiarity allowing you to expose some storage from the hypervisor into the guest as a fast backing device. And this was basically the original design because the idea here was that if you load a program, this program first needs to be read from the disk and placed into main memory before you even can start execution because the execution really can only be done in main memory, not on the storage device. If you now have a storage device which is mapped into your main memory, you would end up having to do a mem copy between one side of the story of the memory into another side of the memory, which is quite pointless, really. So you could as well execute it directly because you already have the address. And this is the underlying idea of the XIP or even the direct access one saying, right, okay, we already have the memory address, let's use it directly and do not do the translation between file systems and the backing device. So they took this original idea from the XIP2 file system and essentially renamed it as DAX for direct access execution to be available for each and every file system. or to be precise, not so much to make it available for each and every file system, but to allow the file system to enable the functionality. Meaning the file system still have to be tweaked and have to be modified to be actually leverage this thing. As it so happens, for some file systems it works perfectly, let's call them XFS. For others, it doesn't really, let's call them ButterFS. Because ButterFS by design, 
will always write to a new location. Well, yes, you know, in most cases, it will write mostly to a new location. Yes, there are ways around it, and actually there are people working on doing so, but initially, um, it doesn't really fall neatly into the butterfly's design. The other thing is that it's really only for MMAP, because what DAX actually does is it intercepts the MMAP call and reroutes the MMAP call to the address they already have. That really is everything, all it does. It doesn't do anything else, which is okay, and it works nicely, but then read and write is actually also byte addressable. So why is it, again, that I can have this speed up only for MMAP? Why can't I do it for read and writes? They might be able to benefit from it, too, wouldn't they? So there must be a better way. And this is how I ended up with writing my own file system. <laughs> because essentially I have to. <laughs> anyway. So the idea here is, so why do I need to modify the file systems for just a single, to emulate a, sim, a single syscall? Why can't I turn the whole thing on its head and expose it as a file system? So I could just literally just write a file system on top of NVDEMS, exposing each namespace as a file. Of course, you wouldn't have directories, but pff, hell, who cares? And you could even use the names, uh, namespace uh, labels to hold the metadata. And this is actually, this idea I actually had after looking at the patches from Damien for Sonefis, who did the very same thing. Why can't we just expose the hardware details as a file system and get rid of quite a lot of, well, metadata handling, which we need to do because the hardware will already does it for us. Same story here. The hardware already does it. We already have namespaces, which really are more or less can be seen as files. They are files. They have names. They have sizes. They have metadata. So that's the file. Easy. Or so I thought. So should be able to do a file system. So right. So I did. It can't be that hard just writing your own file system, can it? Well, yeah. There's a bit more to it, as I, as I found out. But still. So anyway, I just did an implementation on top of 5.6. Um, implementing read-write calls for going directly to the NVDEMS. And this essentially bypassed everything just directly onto it. The goals here were to get as close as possible to the native NVDEM performance to be leverage the byte addressability of it so that I can do sub-block accesses to the actual hardware. And with that, I should be able to measure speed differences between, well, the, uh, the file system implementation and the generic implementation already present in the kernel. Just to see, all right, how much difference is there? How much, how, how, by how much can I do an improvement on the existing implementation if I were to choose? Or would it be better to use this one directly for specific use cases? Who knows? Right. So, um, with that, basically, it means we can measure the benefit any native access would give us. And it would also tell us implicitly for, for which use cases NVDEMs are best suited. So that's what I did. So I did a bandwidth, or a, well, the normal FIO tests, compared the file system I had with the raw PMEM block device, basically just to provide the optimal case I could get with existing implementation. And I had a, run, a random read-write test with a, a, a 70-30 mix, just because that's basically a standard test you do, or I did. Um, the whole thing was on an HP machine, 40 cores, two nodes, 128 gigs of RAM, and two times 256 gigs and VDIMS. Right, and then I got this, and I said, mm, okay, this is now not really very, not really anything I, what I could see, and, but then I remembered this one. Ah, I could maybe just 
maybe I could do a, a logarithmic diagram. Let's see what's coming out of it. And suddenly it says, oh, that's what's happening. Oh, cool. So, bit of explanation. Those nice straight lines is the genetic implementation. The lower ones are the async IO. The top two ones are the normal read-write interface, the normal read-write calls. And the top lines is actually my file system. You said, hey, cool, I'm actually faster. Yay, I did something right. But then looking at it, I said, yeah, I am faster, but not in all cases. Actually, I'm faster for sub-block uh, sub, sub accesses, but yeah, that's what it's being designed for. I'm not really faster if you're going for larger block sizes. So for larger block sizes, the genetic implementation is actually better. And it actually, as you can see, it scales basically perfect. Here's now the later the IOPS comparison, and there you can see it is basically perfect scaling there. So whatever block size you have, you have the same performance for the genetic implementation, which is good, but it also means you won't get the max performance out of it. That's what the file system does. And you can also see with the, um, the, the more, uh, the larger the block size is, the performance for the file system goes down, which is basically due to the fact that it does a straight M copy, and this M copy will copy only so much data. And so in order to do this, so physically, you, will, you need to call more and more and more, um, uh, and more and more, and more um, IOPS there, um, not, anyway, to um, get the same performance. So this is clearly suboptimal for larger block devices, uh, for larger block sizes. Okay. So, for as a result here, for l smaller than 128 bytes, I'm actually good. I'm actually better than the generic implementation. For larger block sizes, meaning larger than 1K, I'm worse. Okay, but this is something I have sort of expected because with this really, really stupid implementation, I really hadn't expected to best the well thought out and fine tuned generic implementation, which is basically what the generic implementation has been designed for. So, yeah, okay, I can live with that. And curious enough, the crossover point is with 512 bytes, meaning the generic block size of the Linux kernel. I thought, hi, hey, cool. Might have some significant, but uh, some, some significance. But if there's any, I haven't found them. And so, for PM block, we have a near ideal scal scalability. And so, for, uh, for my file system, we run in this, into a saturation beyond 128 bytes, and it simply wouldn't go any farther, uh, any further. But for the block device, there simply is no saturation measurable. It's essentially a, a straight line, which I thought perfect scalability. Nah, that doesn't happen. There is no perfect scalability. There will be a crossover point at one time. Somewhere in the future, or somewhere with the larger block size, there will be a crossover point. So let's find it. Let's see where are the limits there. So I did another test, increasing the block sizes until I reached the saturation point, which is what I did. And this is what I got. So I needed to do a test with block size up to four megs just to figure. And incidentally, the lower end is eight bytes. And as you can see, we do scale right now, uh, quite nicely until we are around 64K, 128K. Then suddenly, uh, then we start reaching the saturation. And beyond that, 200, uh, that's, 256 or we yeah, have 256 k blocks. We are in the saturation and we won't be getting any better. In fact, we are getting worse, as you can see there. And this, in fact, it's the top one is actually gigabytes or tens of gigabytes. So that's 32 gigabytes per second. I'm pushing through it. So yeah, and the same you can see uh, on the apps chart. The apps will be, uh, remain constant until a certain point and then start dropping because we're reaching, reaching saturation. And another thing worth of noting is that the async IO interface actually scales better than the read and write uh, interface. 
because the, the async IO interface are the lower two lines starting off, they're actually going far further out than the um, read and write calls. This is basically the overhead we're getting from the page cache, and that's the point where the page cache reaches saturation, so it can't reach the same performance we would have with the async IO interface. Again, basically what I would expect, and it's always nice to know that I did expect the right thing. Okay. So, this is as a conclusion then. Yes, I did quite well. And for small, uh, small box sizes, the file system actually provides you with a better performance. After 512 bytes, we were going into saturation and it wouldn't scale any, any further. And Pima blocks has a nearly perfect scalability, but a lower peak performance. Okay. So, but if you compare this one then for fast storage, say fast storage device, which block device really is, for small uh, byte-wise excesses, NVDIMMs is really better. Okay. For larger block devices, it really, mm, the advantages rapidly start to decrease until there are none. And another thing worth of noting is that the max bandwidth I measured was 30 gigabytes per second. These are gigabytes, incidentally. And the max IOPS I had was 10 million. Okay. This is fast, but not that fast as I would have expected. Because if you look at it, if you go for modern transport, say 200 gig InfiniBand or quad port 64 gig fiber channel, you're actually having the same performance. With 200 gigs, you get 20 gigabytes per second over the link. And if you're dual linked, you have 40 gigabytes. Same for 64 gig fiber channel. If you have a quad port, you're pushing something like 250 gigabytes per second over the wire, uh, if, if 25 gigabytes, sorry. So it's actually in the same range. And if you look at modern HBAs, they can sustain up to four million, four or five million IOPS. So if you put two of them in it, you would be getting the same number of IOPS. So we could actually, should be able to do a fast storage, which has very similar capabilities than NVDIMs. And incidentally, the latest easiers from NetApp does 10 gigabytes per second. So it is not the future. We can actually do it reasonably short time frame. Right. And that was it from my end. Any questions? Uh, out of curiosity, did you benchmark against DRAM? Because the 30 gigabytes sounds much like the limit of the memory controller to me. Um, I did not for this test. I did the previous test, which I could show you if I had my laptop, but as I haven't, I can't. Um, yes, I did some testing, and I found that NVDIMs were about half a minimal impact of 10% of the DRAMs and a maximal impa impact of 80%. Take your pick. So yes, I did some measurement and again, so it might well be that I'm hitting the limits of the DRAM controller here, but then frankly, I don't care. If that's the hardware limit of the machine, okay, it's the hardware limit of the machine. So it's a limitation. Any more questions? If not, thank you very much. Thanks, Hannes. <laughs>